there. WSDQ Dunlap, WEPG South Pittsburgh, The Copperhead, WSDT Saudi Daisy, Chattanooga. The viewpoints expressed on Liberty Works Radio Network are not necessarily those of the network, its affiliates, or sponsors. This is Liberty Works Radio Network. Now live from coast to coast and around the globe, more real talk, the kind you want, on Liberty Works Radio Network. I'm sitting here in my office in Huntsville, Alabama, and I want to tell you, if you are thinking about just changing the dial or dropping off and doing something else, you really ought to listen to this program today. We are going to have on Barbara Bickey. Now, today and for the last 40 years, she's lived in Colorado in the mountains. However, she is originally from Hungary, and she escaped the communist country of Hungary back in 1957. And I thought that her story would be very educational to our listeners, and in fact, it's a story that needs to be heard by every American. Barbara, are you with us? Thank you. You're yes. welcome. Yes, my name is Barbara Bicki. And I was born and raised in Hungary. I, me- I remember the Second World War very well. And my ha- family is still there in Hungary. And I had witnessed also the Holocaust. I watched those precious children be loaded on a wagon and mothers and fathers and was taken from us with yellow ribbon on their arms. It was very stressful and tearful for us, so we tried to give them something to eat, a little package, and then the German soldiers would throw it back to us. And we felt very helpless that that little bit also we could not do for our fellow men. Bob, yes. What, you grew up in what town in Hungary? I grew up in Nyiracsád, Hungary, which is a suburb of the city of Debrecen. The eastern plain, which is border with Romania. And you saw the advent of World War II. Yes, I have. So you were you were just a young child when World War II. Yes, broke I out. was eight years old and when it began. Uh, when did the communists seize power in Hungary? 1945, completely. And that's as a result of the end of World War II, and yes, the sir. Iron Curtain, so to speak, fell down across the Soviet-occupied countries in Eastern Europe, yes, which included sir. Hungary. Yes, sir. What was it like? You know, can you tell us to me, uh, what you recall child, about the advent was, of communism in Hungary in the first days? Uh, from the very beginning, they have uh, exercised the straitjacket. They have told you that if you're not going to do what they ask you to do, what's going to happen to you or to your family? Uh, such as if you disobeyed order, if they ask you even uh, going to school and you had to wear a uniform that was a red tie for a little girl or a little boy or an adult, and if you missed wearing it, you have punished for it. Or it was like a nightmare to me going from one grade to the next grade in school. One day I heard singing and cheerful children everywhere, and, and we sang, and we, they read the Bible to us at school, and it was very educational. We loved it. And we were immersed in everything there was to be learned and to known. And then next day we were told that we could never mention those things anymore, that we have to have uh, high Stalin and salute the statue of Lenin and Stalin. We had to recite the uh, communist uh, anthem and sing it 
And uh, we were called on the carpet if we said anything else that would hurt or damage the, the great communist cause or, or party. All right, so well, therefore, we as a child, we were punished also. Wow. When, when the Soviets took uh, over control of Hungary, they, they first took over the government itself. Yes. And... And from what I envision, you know, that it's a kind of a gradual process by which they take over control of businesses and the land in a country. Can, yes. Can you they, explain they that? They allowed you to operate as you were to begin with. Uh, but as I have mentioned in many places, taxation began to come, and they taxed everything double and triple. And they come from house to house and write down what you have, how many acres of land, what do you raise, how much did you harvest it, how much did you sell that for, how much cows, how much uh, pigs or anything that you have in your yard, it was all noticed, how many chickens, how many dozens of eggs you collect, because half of them was supposed to go to the government headquarters. There was a headquarter that you traded all these things in, provided that they gave a few cents for it, and that's it. So everything half went to the government. You could only keep half of it. Well, at what stage did they suddenly start taking half of everything that you owned? Um, probably within a year. Within a year, there was a tremendous change that has taken place. By that time, the people were fearful for everything. We were afraid to say anything or go anywhere because we had a shadow behind us, and we knew that shadow kept following you. They know everywhere you were, everything you'd done, and everything you said, and you never knew who was the person that turned you in. Secretly, they kept tab on us. In churches, in, in gathering groups, on conventions, or down at the marketplace, anywhere you went, there was a shadow. Spies were everywhere. Yes. So... Uh, they didn't come along and just take all the land and businesses. Not it was at a gradual once, process. gradually. Hey, can you tell our listeners how that happened? First, when we could not afford to keep our business up because of the taxation, 60% taxes we were paying. You can imagine for a small business how long it take you to collapse. You could not bear it. You could not pay your bills. So they say that, I see people, you have problem. Why don't you just give it to the government? And then we can work together as a collectivism. You can work in your store, but the income comes to the government and you get a flat rate. Or you can turn your land into the collective farm, and then you can work for them for so much a day. But once when you were asked to sign your land and business over and came and made you sign, that was no longer yours, and you could never claim it again until communism fell. Wow. When, where were you living when this happened? Close to Debrecen because I worked there in the okay, city so of Debrecen. Okay, you were old enough it's to work when all city. this happened? Pardon me? You were old enough to work when all of this uh, oh, taking yes. of the land happened? We worked from the time we were 12 years old after school. And hey, what kind of a business did your family have? My family had a farm and had a decent living. But when they got through with us, we had absolutely nothing. And I'm not ashamed to tell you that we went hungry many days. My father would go out and sometimes try to 
get a small game so that we can have some meat once a month or twice a month. And that I meant a rabbit or a little deer or doe or something. But then they made it so hard that the communist government owned all the forest. So you could no longer go and hunt. There was two reasons for that. One is when communism took over, two years later, they registered everybody's weapons. And after that, they came and collected them. No one owned a weapon in Hungary and in under communism except the elite, except those that executed. And there were plenty of them. Therefore, you not only lost your right to have a gun and keep one to protect yourself, but you lost your hunting. So you see, people, you lose a lot more than just a gun, sometimes as your very soul living to eat. You mentioned executions. When did that start, and how frequent were they, and describe what would happen? Soon as communism took its roots in 1945, they began to seek you out. And if you were against the government, they take you for that reason, or they find a reason that they can persecute you for, uh, such as if you disobey their order. If they tell you that you cannot go to a forest anymore because it belongs to the government, not to the people. It belongs to the great communist party. Oh, yes, there were hunting for, for the elite. They had, they had their wonderful life and everything they ever asked for because they were the backers of the communist party. But those that would not deny freedom and would not deny God and become a communist party member, we were very much in straitjacket. We were, we were so much watched for every step we were taking and what we were doing, so that any little thing that you have said or done, you could go to jail if you said you hate red colors, which is, was the red flag. So that we saluted the Russian flag and put the Hungarian flag aside, and we sang and marched to the national anthem of the Russian anthem. And that just about broke our hearts in school from changing one of our own and sing another country song. Wow. It, it just tore you a piece, when, especially when you know the good times, the freedom that you had before. And then all of a sudden, everything become like a child. No, you can't touch it. No, no, no. That's all we heard. Also, you were selected. If you were one of them, you had a privilege to sell and buy. But if you were not, you were penalized if you wanted to start a small business. Such as my brother-in-law. He had a little grocery store his own business. When they came and asked him to give it up, he told them, you dirty communist, I will never give it up. I worked for it and get out of here. A few hours later, the entourage of police arrived, and they tie him and they took him. Twelve years he was prisoned off and on, and he was tortured he was hit by a tuba four. His fingers were put between the door until he heard that crack. And that's how they make you talk and say things also that you have never done. So they kept taking him back because he did not want to give up his little business. And he left two little children behind and my sister. He had three nervous breakdowns while he was present, and when he came back home, he could not take care of himself. Wow. This is the result of saying no to communism. Okay, hey, Barbara, we've got a break coming up. 
We've got Thank two you. more segments. Hey, folks, we got more with Barbara Bicky after this short commercial message. She has a great story. Stay tuned. Now live from coast to coast and around the globe, more real talk, the kind you want, on Liberty Works Radio Network. Welcome back to the Truth Attack Hour. I'm Larry B. Kraft, host on Friday afternoons. My guest this afternoon is a lady from Colorado by the name of Barbara Bicky. She escaped from the Soviet-occupied, Soviet-controlled, communist country of Hungary, and she did it in 1957, and she's relating to us some of the salient the details of her life there, and we're going to get around to her escape here in just a moment. Hey, Barbara, right before the break, we were talking about some of the things that you suffered from uh, during the Soviet U- Union. You were talking about, and, and we were getting ready to cover the point of liquidation of people. What did the yeah. communists do about assassinations? Well, you know, <clears throat> they come up with this theory that if they can prison all those people that were against them, they're going to have it everything the way they wanted. So our prisons were f- full with political prisoners, those that has never steal anything or kill anyone, and never done anything wrong, except say that we hate communism and we don't want part of it. We want our freedom back. That was enough for you to go to prison. So you know, this it, was yeah, another big thing stories. that developed in Hungary that pretty soon, you know, you looked around and people that you know that were decent citizens, good people, are prisoned for, for, for very small things that they would say or do. You know, one of the one of part of the Soviet program, the communist program, is to sever the connection of the younger generations with the older generations. So they would they, they would have they had the purpose of liquidating an entire generation. Yes. Did you see evidence of that? Yes, I we have. We have seen evidence of that because it included my grandparents and later on my parents. Of course, they took the younger generation and tried to brainwash them, you know, from they told them that the old was a terrible thing, uh, that only the rich was able to to live and, and the poor had hell because they had nothing. But we're going to take it away from the the rich and the poor, and we're going to put all the together, uh, all of them, and we're going to give it to you what we take from the rich. We're going to send you to any school you want. We're going to teach you this, and we're going to give you this. So they offered the young people a lot of opportunity free. And uh, so the, some of the young people went for it. But those of us that understood wh- how brainwashing it was, we did not go for it. We would, we would stay with the old way as, as we remembered it. And, of course, you know, you were trampled upon in no time, and you were outnumbered uh, because when you offer people freebies, have you ever received a a gift in your life that someone did not pay for it. That's how it is. They took it away from one person and gave that to to the youth, you know, to to use it. Well, uh, you know, we helped our people anyway. They didn't have to take it away and give it to them. And those that were in need, we always helped them. But they wanted to make this div- division among us that communism is a lot better than capitalism, although they always said to us that they hate capitalism because capitalism is there to take, and we communists are here to give. But it was reversed on us what we were seeing. Capitalism gives and communism takes. And, uh, you know, when uh, when fascism was over, communism wasn't uh, any better. It was even worse. So we were hit by two times. So Hungary was... Uh 
operated as a, the form of government it had during World War II was a fascist government? Yes. First it was a fascist type, and then soon we all found out that uh, we were told that something glorious is going to happen because the, the glorious Communist Party freed us. And, of course, 1st of May was always our big celebration in Hungary. And whether you wanted or not, we had to go out there and, and march and sing. And when some dignitary died, such as Stalin, we were all sent out to the street to cry, to, to show that we, how sorry we are and how much we love the party. But we didn't cry because it was Stalin's death and put out the black flag. And if you didn't put out the flag, you were punished and found for it and pay a fine. You see, these were all, all communist ideas, our radios, our stations, our cease to preach, cease to hear any religious songs, cease to see or hear anything about God. It was done in a dungeon, in a basement, behind uh, the papered up windows, and come at night and worship and get together so no one will see us or find us. Because if they did, we were dispersed and sometimes taken to jail to scare us. I remember I was eight years old when I first went to jail because we were out with young people singing Christmas carols uh, under people's uh, uh, house uh, by the window or by the door like we did in the olden days. And we were told that we were punished because we were disturbing the peace, that we can no longer sing at nobody's windows or out on the street. It is forbidden. It's done. So they took us in the jail. And my father came to look for us all over in town. And one of the men says, Mr. Rantel, why don't you go and look in the jail? I heard that they took a whole bunch of young people down there last night because of the Christmas caroling. So my father came and claimed us. And uh, they told my father, if it ever happens again, it'll be him that goes to jail for us. Hey, hey, Barbara, d- d- tell us about the executions that they, you know, they killed a whole lot of people in, in the ex- uh... execution was anyone that would disobey a order from the government of any kind. Then they take him to court. And, of course, if you have a communist judge and a communist jury, who do you think is going to defend you? So many of our people that were taken and got through with all the process, very few of them that was set free. Most of them were set to, to sentence to death or sentenced to, uh, sentence to hard labor or imprisoned uh, at once. And many of them uh, never came home. Therefore, we knew that when we ceased to hear from our loved ones that something terrible happened to them. But we none of us knew what was happening to them until the revolution. And then when some of those were freed, they were telling us, yes, they have heard when they were taking them to the death camp where they were executing them and hanging them. Like, like General Malater, our army general that was with us on the Hungarian revolution, he was executed. Then later, the leader, Imre Nagy, was executed. And then later on, when many years passed by, they dug their body up and reburied them, and they told them they were sorry. But it was too late. They were gone. Wow. Would they round up people and just uh, make charges against them and just... uh If they were against them, them, they secretly picked them up mostly at night so that nobody would see it. Do you have and they just disappeared. Or, they did do you not have a judgment home. or estimate about how many people the Soviet uh, Union, the communists in uh, Hungary, killed uh, in the beginning uh, years of the Hungarian Revolution? Thousands. Thousands upon thousands. 
and even the priest was jailed, uh, uh, the priest Minsenti. He was jailed also because he said words against the Communist Party. And we freed him. We freed him in 1956 during our revolution. And uh, that was, I said, many has died during the revolution. There was just college students, 85 of them gone down. They wanted nothing but to be free. That's the only thing they asked for. And they were gone down. Were they protesting? They were protesting against the government and against what they are doing to us. And so they just sent out police officers or maybe army Yes, soldiers? that was the year army. That was the KJB. You know, during communism, it was so that you had an identity book, and it was everything written about you in it. And you were to identify if you went from one city to the other. Sometimes more than once you were stopped, and you had to identify yourself. They did not trust you. Wow. In the town that you lived in, were there frequent executions of people? No, they usually took them away from smaller town because it would be known a lot quicker than in huge cities. And, but most of the people that they wanted to eliminate, they just uh, threw in jail, put them yes, through a show and they trial. Just, and then, they just mysteriously died. And, and there were thousands what, and what thousands. What was that mystery? There were thousands of people that, that this happened to, tens of thousands? Tens of thousands that never returned. Hmm. Well, Barbara, yes. what did you, in the early 1950s, what were you doing? In the 1950s, I was working in Debrecen, the city that I lived very close to at that time. I was working in a laboratory where we were to identify all kinds of seeds that we plant and also process them uh, for quality. So I was in a quality control also as well as processing. And was this a government-run uh, It was a government-run. And I also, because I had a big mouth and I did not like communism, and most of the time I showed it and said it, I lost that job. But then I learned how to cook, and I learned how to cook very well. So we cooked and served nearly a 1,000 people daily. And uh, I was one of the ten cook among them. So that's where I got my good cooking trade in Hungary. So there was something useful that I have learned. Now, when you were working for the laboratory, were you paid by the government? Yes, they were, but they were all controlled by the government. And, and it was very little. I would compare in U.S. money probably 20 cents an hour. Wow. And uh, the home that you lived in, in the early 50s, where were you living? Was it uh, some property that you owned? Or I was, was living in our own homestead where we were all born, all the seven children. My mother and father had seven of us. They lost two of my brother in a very early age in diphtheria in two weeks apart. They buried two precious little boys. And the brother that I had left, the third boy, was drafted and was taken during the war to East Berlin. In East Berlin, after the war, he was captured and taken to Poland on foot. And from Poland, they told them that they're going to put him on a freight train and send them home. And they found out that they were for weeks and weeks on the train, and they ended up in Siberia. So my brother was a political prisoner in Siberia for three and a half years. My father was drafted because during the Second World War, uh, they have drafted from 16 to 60 of our men's age. That took both of my father and my brother. It left me and my... All right, well, hey, hey, Barbara, the music's come on to let us know we got a commercial break. 
Folks, we have a final segment, 15 minutes long, here shortly after this break. We'll conclude this conversation with Barbara here in a minute. from coast to coast and around the globe. More real talk, the kind you want, on Liberty Works Radio Network. We are back for the final segment with Barbara Bickey today. She's telling us a story about her... A real quick story. This is a very interesting story. It's, I regret that we only have a very short one hour to tell this whole story. But Barbara's got a very interesting story to, to, to tell us about. She lived through the era in which communism took over in, in Hungary. And, you know, one of the first things that they did is they increased taxes until you had to sell your property to the government. And then your life was completely regulated. They took away all the guns. Barbara got fed up with that and, and ultimately escaped. Barbara, I'd like to spend the last 15 minutes in this program talking about your decision to leave Hungary and how you accomplished that. Yes, in, in 1956, uh, when a revolution broke out, I fought in Debrecen for my freedom, uh, such as making sandwiches for the freedom fighters and putting red, white, and green uh, ribbon also around their arms. That means whoever for us will fight with us for our freedom. That was the slogan that we passed around to everybody that we could find. Now, some of them would spit on us, and some of them said to us to keep our mouth shut because it can turn around and this revolution won't last very long, and then we'll, we'll be back at the wheel and we'll let you know. So we were told things that we were not going to make it after the revolution if we will be found. So all these uh, secret services were all around, and, of course, they kept an eye and a camera rolling on the revolutionary people. So in Budapest, it started in the square, and then it spread very quickly like fire into other cities and towns. And this is where i done my part in Debrecen, where I was working. Uh, <clears throat> we were told that we were going to be given better pay and we were going to give given more to, uh, to uh, eat because we were hungry and that we were going to give given more freedom to come and go uh, because where you see the bob wires, you cannot go out and no one can come in. That's, that's why they call them the Iron Curtain of Eastern Europe. That's when you know that you could not cross. Not even to Romania, where some of our relatives lived, we could not visit them. And the West, from America, it was a sin to receive a letter from a relative from America. We had to keep it in secret, and then the post office would track you down that you have a relative in this horrible uh, capitalistic nation. That's how they called us, that you were our enemy, an enemy of the world, and you want war with everybody. This is what they taught us in school. When the revolution fell, and we knew that we had no choice but to either get out and hide. So we have made a decision with my brother and his family and our neighbor and their family that we have to leave in the wee of the night because we're not able to stay. We were told that we will be forgiven for what we did after the revolution. But at midnight, at New Year's Eve, we had a radio announcement from Moscow saying revolutionary people were sorry, but we must find every one of you that participated in this big crime to rise against the great communist might. 
So that was enough for us to know, and therefore we decided that we in secretly are leaving. And if I may say, when we said goodbye to my parents and and to one of my sisters, she has embraced us several times and said, Barbara, my daughter, go and be free. And don't you ever forget who set you free. And I'll be praying and fasting until I hear from you. So she waited from the 7th of January till the 14th until we arrived to Austria. We were processed at the border, and we were welcomed there. 25 buses was waiting. 750 of us arrived at that station. And I went to Costa Neiburg, separated from my family, because we could not fit on the same bus. But everything <clears throat> was worth it for me. Pardon me. Every hardship that I have ever gone through, everything was worth it all just to be free. Uh, Barbara, tell, them, uh, tell our listeners how you got out of Hungary. <clears throat> when you know, the Jan- 11 of the us sixth. pledged together that we will not leave anyone behind, we went on a passenger train secretly to Budapest. And from Budapest to Papa, which was a large Russian soldier station, we had to change to a freight train. And from there on, we hid on the freight train. And then we went up to Chorna, which is close to the Austrian border. And we were waiting there for a while to see when the next freight train will be heading to Austria. But in the meantime, we were hiding at the depot and separated from each other. I carried this four little uh, four-year-old little girl in my arm that called me little mommy. That was my brother's daughter, and my brother's son uh, is five years old, and our neighbor's a child, uh, three years old. And uh, when the guard came up to ask for my identity, was the same guard that saw me in Debrecen, the city where I was living. <clears throat> and he said, I'm surprised to see you on the west from the east. What did you bring you here? And I said, uh, we are traveling to see our relatives. And he was asking me more questions and for my identity book. And I gave it to him. And in the meantime, this little girl hugged me and said, oh, my little mommy, I love you so. Of course, I wasn't her mommy. Really, I was just her aunt. But that's the way she called me. So this soldier looks at me twice and she, he says, you're the girl that I saw in Debrecen, did I? And I said, yes. Ah, he says, a girl, an ill gentleman child. And he threw my book back and walked away. That child saved me that day at that moment and all of us. Then when we arrived into Austria, there was another incident at the border that I tell you also. We were on a freight train. And we were told by the caboose men to hide anywhere at the end of the train, either in the box guard or if he can give us enough room under his bed or in the clothes closet or make one person like a pillow and cover it with a cover, but don't make a move and don't make a noise. Hold the children's mouth as long as you can because this train will be examined by the Hungarian and Russian soldiers every inch of it before they go to west. And here came the two soldiers, two Hungarians and two Russians, and we could hear the snow cracking under their boots, and we know that they were close to the caboose, and here they were stopping up on the step. And they put their hand on the bed, and the bedspread was moving, and their boots was almost touching our feet. And the little chihuahua dog was sitting on that bed that belonged to the caboose man. We called him a caboose man. 
And then when the Russian soldiers came up to begin to tear the place apart, this little Chihuahua dog ran and got a bite of his behind and hold on to his pants. No matter how he was trying to shake him up, he couldn't. And finally, the Hungarian soldier says, why don't we just get off of here and go? The caboose man says, there is nobody on this train except him. So he finally dragged the Russian soldiers down with the little dog hanging on to him, and he was going to shoot that dog. So finally, the caboose man came and embraced that little dog and said that, you have to shoot me if you shoot my dog. And that saved us. They quit searching under the bed or in the caboose uh, clothes closets and wherever they were going to. So all the 11 of us saved again by this one little chihuahua dog. And don't tell me that God does not use them because he did in each incident. And then the train began to go. And that when he told us that pretty soon you all have to get off. And from now on, you are on your own. 78 miles walking on foot, the children on our back. There was many stormy nights, and if you ever watch Dr. Zhivago's film, you can imagine what our clothes look like and our hair that we could not even see out from our eyelashes, from the frost covering us everywhere. So when, when we came near to the, the last the night... What? Would the last walk? night, I will explain to them that when we came near to the last night, there was two lights ahead of us that shined at us. Of course, we have walked and fallen all night in that storm. And then at the big light, my brother said, let's not go in there. It does not look like an average place. In the meantime, we've been knocking into villages for a piece of bread. We licked the snow for our water, but we needed something more to eat. And finally, we reached a little village that we could only find one house and a tiny little candle light burning. And we knocked on the window, and this gray-headed lady came, and she said, Oh, no, no, what do you want from me? And we said, Lady, we don't want nothing but tell us where we are. We are escaping. And she said, You are escaping. The border is about 150 meter from my land and the bob wires are beginning there and run run as fast as you can because every two hours you see that big light that you passed that's the russian and hungarian soldier station and they take turn every two hours to guard this border run get out And we did. And we came to the Bob Byers and some of the places where the border is that are mines underneath the Bob Byers. And we began to dig and dug the the frosty ground with our fingernails until it was big enough to push through the children and then push through the ladies and then the men. And we ran down into the hills of Austria in that valley. And that's when we found out that the soldiers found our footprint and they know the dug out where we dug the ground and they began to send the rocket up and we did not know why but that meant that they were asking for help from the Hungarian and Russian soldier station that so, we almost so, hey, accidentally almost walked into. Let, 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 me, let, let me ask you this. So you, uh, you escaped by cl- climbing under the, the fence Yes. And went into a town in Austria? Yes. And how did you get to the United States? And when, when, let me just say one more thing before we, we, we go to the next. When we arrived close to the flag of Austria, we were on our hands and knees. We could no longer walk from the frostbite and the cold. But this man came and said, don't be afraid. I am a policeman here to pick up the refugees that are coming through our borders. And we were crying, and he took the, the children out of our arms 
And he said to us these words, Please, don't cry. Can't you see? You're free. Well, hey, Barbara, thank you for being my guest this afternoon. Thank and folks, you. be sure to listen to the other great programs here on the Liberty thank Works Radio so Network. Have a good weekend. You too.